Hello, and welcome to the Arts Are Education Talk It Up podcast, where we talk to national, state, and local leaders who are working to make arts education part of every student's life. I'm Jim Palmerini, your host. Arts Are Education is a initiative sponsored by the National Coalition for Core Arts Standards. NCAS is a collaboration of eight national arts and arts education organizations who actively work to ensure quality standards-based arts education opportunities for every student. Today, we are talking to Erica Hawthorne, the Education Specialist for the Arts Education Partnership, an initiative that has been supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and the U.S. Department of Education since its inception in 1995. AEP is currently administered by the Education Commission of the States. Welcome, Erica. Thank you, Jim. It's great to be here. And we are thrilled that you are here. So today, we are here to talk about one very particular aspect of AEP work, the Equity Working Group. Uh, the Equity Working Group and their advisory member partner, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, created the Equity Working Group to enable organizations and their leadership to explore diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, DEIA, issues in ongoing dialogues that would deepen their understanding and to develop strategies to inform their organizational missions. I think I have that right. So to begin, uh, how, how did AEP and NASA come to partner on the launch of the Equity Working Group and, and maybe why? Sure. Well, well, to start, just a little context on AEP. We are the nation's hub for arts and education leaders, building leadership capacity to support students, educators, and learning environments. We do this through research, reports, convenings, and counsel, which is also kind of couched as technical assistance. And our whole goal is to help leaders gain knowledge and insight that will help them ensure all learners receive an excellent arts education. And as engagement specialists with AEP, I kind of serve as a point person for partners, affiliates, and people who want to learn more about our work uh, so people can reach out and learn more about opportunities to engage. But part of my portfolio includes managing our working groups. And the equity working group is one that I'm really excited to talk about today. Um, and, And as you asked, we started this work back in 2018, and we put out a call to our partners before starting the equity working group. And NASA is who volunteered to step up and co-chair this this opportunity. And a really amazing um, group that it is. And I just want to say personally, it has meant a lot to me. I I am a a member of a working group uh, and uh, I I find the work really gratifying. So uh, what's a typical profile of an organization that's invested in the equity working group network? Sure. So about two years ago now, we launched a new strategic mission that really expanded our partnership model so that it's not just the national organizations, but we also have space to engage with local, regional, and even individuals in the arts ed space. So with that, we expanded our working group to be open to all partners and affiliates. Uh, For this working group, we have a good mix of some national organizations and some more local affiliate organizations. Um, there's about, I think we're at about 20 or so members right now, and they're really operating as a cohort. So we, we kind of close membership for a little bit to build that trust and get deeper into the work, but it will be opening back up once the group is ready to expand and kind of go to the next phase. Erica is going to share some amazing information here, but she is also in the process of creating an arts, our education blog. Uh, that I'm sure will supplement what she has to say here and include some links to all of the things that we're talking about here today. There is a statement, the Lands Acknowledgement Statement, that is um, read at the outset of every meeting. So I I thought it would be appropriate here for us to hear that statement. Uh, So Erica, could you go ahead and read the Lands Acknowledgement Statement? Absolutely. And just for a little context here, we'll share these links in the blog. But if you go to nativeland.ca, 
There's a whole bunch of resources that explain why land acknowledgements are important, what they are, and some tips on how to craft your own. So the one that I'm gonna read today is created by the, or used by the Arts Administrators of Color Network, and we adapted it for this equity working group. Um, but pretty much we start each meeting by inviting people to share in the chat where they're joining from. And so for me, today I'm joining from our DC office in DuPont Circle of Washington, DC, on the ancestral territory of the Nakotank and Piscataway people. And uh, here's the script that we pretty much start each meeting off with. To center our group in acknowledging and honoring the histories that have led to inequities we are fighting today, we invite you to join us in starting each meeting with a land acknowledgement. In your agenda, we've included a link to more information on what land acknowledgements are and why they are important. We believe every community owes its existence and vitality to the generations around the world who contributed to making history that led to the movement we are in now. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that we are a part of, that we're a part of bringing us here today. As this is a national call, let's pause in honor of the lands where you work and live and the groups of people that live there before you. We invite you to use www.native-land.ca to identify the lands which you are on. Please feel welcome to share the name in the chat and then we pause for a moment to identify the lands that we all occupy. And as we center ourselves towards this work, let's remember those for whom equity was not an option. You know, I think that statement is so powerful in itself. And, and by the way, let me just say, uh, I am dwelling on the land of the Chippewa in the Ohio Valley, centered right now in Cincinnati. What was the impetus, you know, for actually reading that statement? How did that come about? And, and, and what purpose does it, do you think it really serves for members as they attend these meetings? Sure. So we wanted to do something that really roots us in one of the core concepts of equity, which is having a connection to the past and supporting larger truth-telling efforts. So starting with a land acknowledgement is really an opportunity to kind of ground the group, reset from whatever other meetings we're having throughout our day, and acknowledge the land that we're on and the people who came before us. I think often when we're talking about equity work or diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, it can become intellectual and very, very theoretical. And just doing something like this kind of grounds the conversation in something real, <laughs> that we're really connected to this land that was occupied and, and there's a history here um, that has led to a lot of inequity. So that, that's kind of the thinking behind starting with that. And there's lots of ways you can approach it that can go even deeper. And the resource I'll share will offer some tips, uh, but it is important to just take that moment to pause and try to be as authentic as possible so it doesn't become just reading it off. And there's actually that moment to reflect on the histories we're talking about. Yeah, you know, it always, it always feels a bit like um, a meditative prayer to me, a moment to in fact pause and to, um, make it uh, real and not an abstract intellectual exercise. Exactly. And, and the idea is to take cues from the indigenous protocols, which are shared on the website, so that we're opening the space with a level of reverence and respect. Let's actually talk about the really amazing work, uh, the inquiry-based work that the equity group is actually doing. In fact, it's multiple groups, actually, really. So could you yeah, so I'll try not to go through the whole timeline, but I could go <laughs> for a long time talking about each step, but I'll do a high level overview that we started back in 2018, just doing a broad scan of our partners to see what people were currently doing. We worked really closely with Susan Auction at NASA, who helped create this survey that we, we launched with about 18 partner organizations, kind of like a focus group. 
And from those learnings, we created a few takeaways of here's a list of tactics you can um, look to if you're just getting started with this work. We compiled some definitions, but through that process, we realized we were becoming very deliverable based and trying to get to create a toolkit or create resources for the field. And we took a step back and, and thought about what would be most impactful. Is it most helpful for AEP to publish takeaways and documents or to actually create that space for partners to deepen their learning and make sure we know what we're talking about <laughs> before we start publishing deliverables? So uh, I wanna say it was maybe 2019 or so when we switched our approach instead of like our typical working groups, which focus on putting out certain products or, or information for the field, we re-centered as an inquiry-based learning community. And with that, we asked each uh, member of the working group to help design our own inquiry questions. And those are around what were the most interesting or most pressing issues at their organizations that they wanted to learn more about. And with those inquiry questions, we've created subgroups that get to have a facilitator and dedicated time to really unpacking how to address that question. And I'll, I'll read a couple off to you because right now we have four subgroups really digging into some content areas. One of them is looking at how we can operationalize looking at situations from many perspectives to challenge dominant narratives, specifically in arts education, and how we can prioritize which narratives need to be challenged most. Another group is talking about how to better center youth experiences and engagement and to create decision points and processes in our arts education work to make sure that youth are represented and that their voices are heard. Another group is looking at hiring and advancement practices that prioritize Black, Indigenous, and people of color leadership. And another group is focused on how to center Black, Indigenous, and people of color voices, experiences, aesthetics, et cetera, in their programs, workshops, funding, and all of their arts education work. So these, were, these came from a list of about 25 questions that we had to narrow down. And it was really interesting to see where the groups landed on what they wanted to focus on most. How often do the groups meet? And you know, what are those dialogues like in the individual groups? How are they, how, how, how are they doing, I guess is my question. This is actually perfect timing. <laughs> We've been in our inquiry model for a little bit over a year. And we just had a meeting a couple of weeks ago where we asked the group for feedback on how it's going. And pretty much our structure, we've moved from meeting every month to every other month, just because schedules, it felt a lot more realistic that way. The group comes together for about an hour and a half. We always start with our land acknowledgement and some community agreements for how we wanna show up in the space. Those include, uh, let's see, some of the things in the community agreements are honoring confidentiality, speaking from our own experience, being curious, open, and respectful. And there's a link to that on our website if people want to dig a little deeper. Um, but after our kind of introduction as a full group, we send everyone into their breakout groups where they can dig into an inquiry process around their question. I, I'm really interested in, you know, the moment in which it was decided to do capacity building, to build leadership versus products. We are all so committed to making stuff, which is great. And by the way, of course, you've got some stuff that the group has built. But could you talk a little bit more about how the business of building leadership fits into the larger mission of AEP anyway in the work that the Equity Working Group does? Sure. So a couple of years ago, I'm still having a hard time with time during the pandemic. <laughs> but a couple of years ago, when our director, Jamie Casper, came on board, we were revamping our 2020 action agenda to create a new strategic mission for AEP. And that's when we shifted from having four priority areas to really thinking about how our partners are the ones empowered to change the learning environments and, and deliver excellent arts education whereas our role is really to build leadership capacity and knowledge for our partners. And so with this particular working group, after we did a scan of what members were currently doing, we got a little bit into creating definitions, 
and what it would look like to create a toolkit. And through those conversations, it became evident that because we serve such a broad and diverse membership or partnership, creating something that would make sense for every organization would be such a huge task. And we had to acknowledge that we're pretty early in our own equity journey. So for us to be so focused on putting out deliverables before kind of walking the walk ourselves felt a little bit off. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when we, we talked to the group and decided this might be more beneficial to create a safe space where people can share where they are in their journey, deepen their knowledge, and have an opportunity where you can make, you can make mistakes, you can ask questions, um, and you can really just share examples of what your organization is struggling with, and we can help each other find solutions within this safe space of the learning community. Yeah, I, I think that what has been most impressive to me is that um, all organizations are in this together and in a discovery process. Um, mm -hmm. I can recall those conversations about there was no one definitive um, definition of mm -hmm. DEI uh, and the A, which I want to ask you about in a minute. Oh. So uh, it, I think, has been courageous of the partnership to take this work on when they themselves if I can use the phrase, we are flying and building the airplane at the same time together. So about that, um, more commonly, the lexicon has been DEI. That is what you hear in the education world and far beyond that uh, throughout uh, our culture. But the A, the access, which makes sense on a certain level, but how did that A came into being in, in this work? What does the access really mean here? Yeah, well, you can say access or accessibility. I think access is making sure that students have access to arts education through their classrooms, communities, families, homes. Um, accessibility is more specifically focused on making sure that uh, we're addressing the needs of the disability community through our programs, through our organizational structures and things along those lines. Um, I, I can't say there was a specific decision point because to me, all of those really just go together because <laughs> you, you can have each individually, but if you don't have accessibility, are you really being inclusive and creating a diverse environment? So I, I just think they all really work together and are all necessary. So we, we've just had that in our approach from the beginning. What has this work meant for you? personally, because you mentioned you, you're you passionate about this work. Sure. So I would say equity work. Before I had the language to call it diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, it was just a big part of my upbringing to think about racial justice and, and how we can create a better world. Uh, but specifically for this working group, when I was in my master's program at American University, my capstone research was actually doing this work for the equity working group. So I was brought on as a consultant to do the interviews with AEP partners and kind of create some takeaways and share back to AEP what I learned from those interviews. And when a position opened up and I had the opportunity to join full time, that was a really exciting experience to take the kind of outsider perspective and be able to come inside and help do something with that information. So it's meant a lot to me to be at a national organization where we're creating this space and I can share ideas and resources and connect with other leaders across the country to help them start this work or continue this work based on wherever their organization is. And one more thing I can add on that is originally I had created just kind of an overview of what we learned from those interviews and what DEI is. And we've since been able to turn that into a very introductory kind of orientation that we can offer to our partners and affiliates. So that has been really exciting to just help organizations that don't exactly know where to start or don't know how to advance their work and be able to give those resources, give them a space to meet with other leaders. And one, one more thing I really want to plug about the equity working group is as we've been having these conversations around these inquiry questions, the group has really appreciated just going through the process rather than being so focused on deliverables. So there's opportunities, for example, the group I um, facilitate is focused on dominant narratives. 
And one activity we did was getting some common language and looking at different concepts, not to wordsmith the perfect definition, but to make sure the whole group was on the same page with the actual concept behind the term. So let's say if the term is equity, it's not as important to have the perfectly wordsmith definition. It's more important to get the concept that this has to be rooted in history, rooted in justice. Here's some examples of organizations doing it well. And we really were able to have some interesting discussions and share knowledge around that without the pressure of, we have to make the perfect definition to publish on the website. So I think removing that deliverable side of things really opens up space for people to learn and just have more psychological safety to make those mistakes. I love what you had to say about being able to create um, uh, a process for new organizations to come in. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it seems that that um, supports your strategy of creating a safe space as well. Because one of the things I have appreciated is that open dialogue uh, without the pressure of having to come up with a definitive product, whatever that might be. Where is the working group going in 2021 and 22, which will be oh. upon us before we know it? I am glad you asked because I am so excited about this part. <laughs> <laughs> We've finally gotten to a point where we're going to start bringing in outside experts to support each of the inquiry groups. So at our last meeting, we asked the groups to come up with what specific technical assistance would be most helpful. And we actually have a small budget dedicated to either bringing in guest speakers, consultants, whatever it takes to help the groups get to the next level of understanding. Because admittedly, we, we are facilitating the groups as staff members and we, we have facilitation skills, but we don't claim to be experts in DEI or accessibility. So we wanna bring those experts in and what we're envisioning is having consultants who can lead specific presentations, whether it's on uh, youth engagement or creative youth development or hiring and advancement practices. Uh, this can look like workshopping policies that each member can take back to their organizations and try to implement. It could look like people bringing samples of policies at their organizations or programs and getting critical feedback from experts that can tell them how to do that work better. Um, or it could be guest speakers around a specific topic the group is interested in. So we're really excited to get those next steps underway in the coming months or so and to see where this takes us. I guess my final question would be, what would you say to an organization that is seeking, whether they are arts education or not, mm -hmm. to really activate um, their mission around DEIA work. Because uh, we know that there are challenges that we talk about for staff or for boards or for membership. So what do you say to an organization that's at you know, ground zero in this work? Sure. I would say that there. The answers are out there. <laughs> they may not be perfect, but there are so many resources, so many experts, and expertise can live in places you may not expect. It doesn't always have to come from a consultant or a certain organization. You likely have expertise in your own staff, <laughs> people who can share their lived experiences or their ideas. Um, one thing our working group did was to create an internal resource bank with all sorts of reading materials, documentaries, videos, even a list of consultants you can tap if you want someone to do an introductory. Here's how to get started with your work or how to better walk the walk if you already have the mission statement and, and language piece done. Um, but yeah, not only are there resources that can guide you, there's also communities you can join. There's our working group. There's lots of, uh, let me think, there's lots of learning communities that just have like lunch and learn sessions or cohort models. Um, but yeah, anyone who's interested can reach out to us and I can connect them with the resources we know about, or we can always do a search and help make some introductions beyond the people already in our network. But yeah, definitely the work is important. And if you don't know where to start, just ask and there's plenty of resources you can offer to help get that work started. And at that, 
I'm going to put in a plug for the, the really amazing uh, resource uh, list that uh, the Equity Working Group AEP have put together. And Erica, let me just say thank you for coming to the Archer Education Talk It Up podcast. And we will look forward to sharing your blog in the coming days, which will uh, support the podcast and vice versa. Uh, you can find out more about the Arts Education Partnership at www.aep-arts.org. And those amazing AEP Equity Working Group resources, they are not a secret. They are publicly available. So please visit um, those pages. And um, you can also reach out to Erica, who has been gracious enough to share her email address. Uh, and she is uh, amazing and has uh, so much to offer and has been so generous and gracious with her time. So Erica, thank you once again for being here. And uh, I look forward to learning more about the Equity Working Group. And lastly, don't forget, you can learn more about Arts R Education at arts, <laughs> www.artsareducation.org. You can reach me at are at artsareducation.org and come visit the website. And don't forget to pledge your support for arts education or to urge your school district and their board to fund arts education this year and next year. And at that, we are signing off. Thank you so much for being here, and we will see you the next time.